minutes. Ours were an hour 45, so I think I got about 45 minutes okay. if I, I if I use I, it all. As I said earlier, I uh, I'm, I'm strict on the uh, rules and uh, lax on the enforcement, so I'm not going to shut you down mid sentence. In that case, I'll think well, no, well, I was going to say <laughs> within reason, within reason. All right, any, anything else before we start? No. Thank you, Judge. It simply cannot be reasonable for someone to be holding an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle with powerful ammunition and be chased by someone who is unarmed who's smaller than him, who's shorter than him. And the first thing that you do to defend yourself is you plug four rounds into it. You shoot it from about four feet away, and not from four feet from Mr. Rittenhouse, four feet from the end of that gun. Your first shot immobilizes him. It shatters his hip. Then he's caused to go forward. And if you watch the videos, and we're going to watch a couple during this brief rebuttal, he crumples. He immediately crumples to the ground. No one is saying that Mr. Rosenbaum should have chased Mr. Rittenhouse. No one is saying that Mr. Rittenhouse did not have a right to defend himself. This case is about the right to use deadly force. And I want to talk about that standard because Attorney Richards, perhaps on accident, misstated it. He said that the standard is that it could cause death or great bodily harm to Mr. Rittenhouse, or that it is likely to cause death or great bodily harm to Mr. Rittenhouse. That is absolutely not what the standard is, and that is not what this trial is about. The standard is the defendant may intentionally use force which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm, such as fire an AR-15, only if the defendant reasonably believed that the force used was, ne was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. Not, oh, if you repeatedly smash someone's face, it might lead to injury. Not, oh, this could have happened imminent death or great bodily harm. There's an old phrase that I could kill you with my bare hands. And there is literally no evidence that Mr. Rosenbaum was capable of that. Mr. Rittenhouse has size on him. We heard how he's a swimmer. We heard how he's a lifeguard. He's apparently in some kind of shape. Punch him in the face. Kick him in the testicles. Knee him in the face. Hit him with your gun. You don't just immediately get to shoot someone. And I don't care about provocation or any of that. Put that aside. It is not reasonable for any adult, for any person, for any 17-year-old male to not try and defend yourself first using other methods. Now, you factor in provocation, the fact he had no right to retreat, or no, no ability to, or he had to retreat, and that he had to exhaust all methods. Clearly, if there is provocation, he's guilty. But even outside of provocation, why do you get to immediately just start shooting? As Mr. Binger said, he brought a gun to a fist fight. And he was too cowardly to use his own fist to fight his way out. He has to start shooting. And let's just say, theoretically, that we think, that the 12 of you think that it is reasonable to have used force deadly force in that situation. Shoots once, takes out his hip. What does Mr. Rittenhouse have to do to avoid that? Well, maybe take one step back. And Mr. Rosenbaum is no threat. And Mr. Rittenhouse is responsible for every round of that gun. It did not have to happen as fast as Mr. Rittenhouse made it happen. He could have held back at one shot. He could have held back at two shots. The guy in the blue hoodie who came in to ki uh, attempt to kick him didn't get four shots. Mr. Rosenbaum didn't get four shots. 
and Mr. Gross Kreutz did not get four shots. The defendant has the ability to gauge what he is doing and to stop shooting. Mr. Richards talks about the threat being immobilized. What threat to someone six inches shorter than you that you've already shot in the hip and is already falling to the ground have? Why do you have to keep tracking them and shooting them and ending up with a kill shot in the back? Hit them, kick them, knee them, anything else. And Mr. Rosenbaum and Mr. Rittenhouse are alive. Because the defense talks about games that the prosecution has played. Let's talk about games. Let's talk about how Mr. Rittenhouse on that night did not tell Dominic Black, did not tell Joanne Fiedler, did not tell anyone about this grabbing of the gun. Didn't tell anyone about, oh, I was afraid they were you use the gun against me. That is because once Mr. Rittenhouse and his team understood that an unarmed person chasing him and unarmed people chasing him later on would not be enough to meet this standard, to meet this privilege, they had to concoct a story. They had to concoct a story about how uh, suddenly I was in great fear of this gun being used. And if that's the real reason, why didn't Jason Lukowski know that? Why didn't Dominic Black know that? Why didn't Joan Fiedler know that? You darn well know if there was any evidence of the defendant saying that the night of, we would have heard about it. So yes, Mr. Rosenbaum is four feet or so from the barrel of the gun. He gets shot in the hip. He begins to crumple. Now remember, we did this demonstration when the doctor, when Dr. Kelly testified. This bullet entered here in the middle finger and came out here. This is how you grab something. I'm Mr. Rosenbaum trying to take this gun away. And this is how I'm going to do it with my hand turned uh, almost completely around and with apparently my fingers spread because these two don't get soot. Uh, which may mean they were on the gun or outside of the path, and the other ones do get soot. We're not talking about injuries to the palm here. We're not talking about injuries like this or any kind of grabbing injuries. We're talking about either something accidental or completely defensive to knock that gun away as he's being shot just before he is killed on the third or fourth shot. Well, we're supposed to believe that Mr. Rosenbaum is Jason Bourne or John Wick or some other movie star hero who's capable of killing with his bare hands and deserved the treatment that he got from the defendant. Mr. Richards' closing was quite personal. If not taking shots personally, Mr. Binger, he was gloating and boasting about his client's kills. And he talked a lot about the Zeminskis. He knows darn well that the Zeminskis are charged by my office and they have a Fifth Amendment right. This is a criminal Mr. defense Roger, attorney. Stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop. Let me ask you to step out for a moment, would you? What's your objection? It's not in evidence, and Mrs. Zeminski does have a right. Her case has been disposed of, and she did not appeal. She did not plead or was charged with any arson, which the defense could get into, and she would have a Fifth Amendment right. Wait a minute. As I recollect, I think I have the case. 
as I handled the Jason. Uh, Josh uh, Zeminski. What's that? Josh Zeminski. That's pending. Right. Mr. Zeminski's case is pending, and it has been repeatedly adjourned to follow this case. Um, at the state's request. Um, I handled the case of Mrs. Zeminski, and I, she, she came out on a reduced charge. It was a recommendation, I think, for a seven-day sentence. And a, she, was a, she was being revoked and sent to prison. I, don't, I know the pictures of that case. But if if Attorney Richards can... Well, she, don't, she wouldn't have a right of... Um, I think I... I sentenced her to seven months in prison consecutively to her sentence uh, and I don't think, she, why would she have a testimonial privilege any longer? If there are charges outside of what she was charged with? She wasn't charged with any arsons. Are you going to charge her? I don't know. Probably not. All of the charges out of the event I can't were wrapped hear you, up. Mr. All of the charges out of the event were wrapped up. They can't piecemeal the charges, and to argue that she has a Fifth Amendment right now is ridiculous. I did say Mr. Zeminski had a Fifth Amendment right, and then the objection came. I did not say Mrs. Zeminski. I can clarify that Mr. Zeminski has well, a Fifth Amendment right. Well, let's find out from the report of what was said. I thought it was just Mr. Said that Zeminski's are charged by my the office, and they have a Fifth Amendment right. The, did you say the Zeminski's? Yeah. Both. All right. Well, then I, I, I'll clarify. Uh, I'll sustain the objection. I understand. Um, all right. Um, all right. Um, ask the jurors to come back in, please. Right, I've sustained the objection because the statement which was made by Mr. Krauss was not accurate, at least as regards uh, Mrs. Zeminski. Any question? Go ahead, Mr. Krauss. Ms. Zeminski was charged and convicted by my office. Mr. Zeminski still has pending charges. Attorney Richards knows that he has a Fifth Amendment right to not testify. Um, you can... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you to step in the library again, please. not in evidence. Two, if he wants to say he has a Fifth Amendment right, they also can grant him immunity. They're the only people who can. And if they're going to say that, I should have a sir rebuttal 
to explain it to those 12 people. They hold the keys to Mr. Zeminski testifying or not testifying. We just heard two hours of how terrible Joshua Zeminski was and the defense wants us to offer him immunity. That's completely That's our decision. Said, Mr. Krause, please. He still has a Fifth Amendment right. What I'm saying is accurate. But you, you know, the questioning, the, the, the question you're asking, the Zabinski case has been here on a number of occasions, and it has been either, uh, it's been a mutual request to adjourn the case. Who's his lawyer? Mr. Barth. Okay, it's been repeatedly requested that it be adjourned, and I assumed, or was told, I'm not sure which, that it would be adjourned pending the outcome of this case. No, that's not true? No. I don't know. I, I, well, it's not true. It is. It, it is true that I assumed it. Uh, whether I was told that or not, I don't it's, know. It's, it's not the same as Dominic Black, Your Honor. There's. It's. It's a different situation. Mr. Zminski's case will go to trial on January 31st. Well, that's the plan. But why was it being adjourned? I think there was some. Uh, we had a witness who was not available at the last trial date, so we needed more time to get them in. Okay. Um. And, and, and Mr. Richards also brings up a point that. You have control over the availability of a witness in terms of uh, grant of immunity, but I don't want to get into that because I think on the first point he made, which is that I don't think it's an evidence. I asked Mr. DeBruyne about it. What did you ask Mr. DeBruyne? I uh, asked Mr. DeBruyne that when we were talking about our meeting that he uh, was going to be a witness against Mr. Zeminski and that Mr. Binger talked to him mostly about Mr. Zeminski because there's a pending case against Mr. Zeminski. Say again. Uh, after Mr. De Bruin talked about our meeting on cross-examination, I asked Mr. De Bruin, I believe this was a while ago, I indicated that he was going to be a witness in the Zeminski case and that Mr. Binger asked him mostly about Zeminski. And why would Mr. Binger ask questions about Mr. Zeminski in an effort to change his statement in the Rittenhouse case? And he had no answer for that. What's that got to do with the, if the, the, right. that the district attorney is making, or the defense attorney is making? It's that there's an open pending case against him. There, there was specific testimony that there was a trial date on January 31st. That came in through Mr. De Bruyne, and I actually mentioned it in my closing because it's in evidence that there's a pending case. I'm prosecuting Mr. Zeminski and the trial's coming up in January. That is in evidence, Your Honor. That has nothing to do with the amendment, which is what I'm objecting to in bringing that into this. Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 um, you're making it sound as if, well, you're making it sound incorrectly so, that Mr. Zeminski is unavailable um, because of his testimonial privilege. But uh, now Mr. Um, Richards is asking whether he should be allowed a sur sur rebuttal to, uh, so the jury would understand that that is somewhat under the control of the district attorney. But I'm not going to, at this point, I'm not going to get further into that. I'm just going to ask you to move on to something else. Well, my next line of argument is that the defense named, their, named them in their witness list and could have called the Zeminskis. No, they no, we can't because he's got a Fifth Amendment privilege for the very reason called, you indicate. And privileges must be claimed as much as possible outside the presence of the jury. That's the statute. They, they could have called Kelly Zeminski. They ridded her here from prison. So uh, Pardon me? We had to have her available in case something came up. That doesn't mean we have to call her. We have no obligation to put anybody on the witness stand. Nor does the state. And the, you, Mr. The state Mr. <laughs> Richards commented many times about how we could have called them, which I think was dishonest given the Fifth Amendment issue. But then also I can call, I can mention that when he set up and read his witness lists, the Zeminskis were on it and they have the ability to call them as well. The witness list is not in evidence. Their opening statements, and he commented on those multiple times. I don't. I. I. I.
Um, what was you, what was the last statement you made now that drew the objection? That Mr. Zeminski has an open case and a Fifth Amendment right. Well, that is an accurate statement. That I should be able to fill in the holes because they're the ones who can give them immunity. I can't call them. Well, I know that, but... Uh, Why'd you see him then? You know, you know, you know... You can he was sitting in the hallway no, no, for two no, days. No, no, no. You address your remarks to me, both of you. To it's me. Not, 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 not to each other, please. please. It's called being prepared. I don't no. know what's going to happen at a trial. Okay. Well, I think I'm just going to tell the jury that Mrs. Zeminski was uh, would have been available for call uh, to be called by either party. Okay. Fine. Fine. Oh man, I got out of it alive. Okay. Um, <laughs> ask them to come in, please. All right, folks, uh, what the situation is that Mrs. Zeminski would have been available to either party to call as a witness, and neither of them has, neither of them has done so. Okay, any question? Go ahead, Mr. Krause. Thank you. Mr. Richards also mentioned that Attorney Binger talked about how all these people are liars, and he was being acting like a whiny defense attorney. I don't know why that language had to be used, but... Mr. Binger never said any such thing. He never called anyone a liar, except for perhaps Mr. Rittenhouse. And Mr. Richards talks about how, well, in the state's opening, you heard nothing about provocation. Mr. Richards knows that is a specific thing, that instruction we get from the judge at the end of the trial. Had we mentioned at the beginning, he would have objected. He would have objected. <laughs> Now let's talk about this threat, this supposed threat. Mr. Richards talked about that gas station and showed the video and it showed Mr. Rosenbaum at the end. Attorney Binger had said he's not in this video as it started and you don't hear anything from him. And that is true. At the very end, he is seen standing quite a bit away from Mr. Balch and Mr. Rittenhouse. This is where that supposed threat happened. There's a distance between them. Next time the camera pans back, the protesters are pushed back. And you never hear this threat. You hear nothing. And Mr. And apparently that is what the defense is accepting is where the threat happened. Although Mr. Rittenhouse actually does not accept that because he said it, it happened a block or two north. So they can't agree on when the threat took place. They can't agree on where the threat took place. And it's the only few seconds of that part of the night that is not on tape anywhere. It's another concoction to give credence or to give weight that, oh, he had to defend himself against an a unarmed man. 
There's been talk about how the defendant came around that Duramax and raised his gun. That didn't seem to be a, a, a contested issue in the case until the defendant lied about it on the stand. The defense themselves submitted an exhibit, number 41, in which it is, it is denoted where the uh, person that put that video together indicates Rittenhouse pointing gun at Zeminski's. I think it has a question mark. This was their exhibit. There was testimony from Detective Antaramian, and we showed this drone video. Now, but then the defendant won't admit to it on the stand, and then all of a sudden the defense has to fight it and talk about hocus pocus and make up little clever rhymes. The defendant could have told you the truth, but that hurts his case, and that gives us provocation. Now, I did, in, I did have, on rebuttal, Mr. Armstrong put in two very blurry pictures. Mr. Binger didn't even mention these pictures in his closing, because they're maybe the fifth, sixth, or seventh strongest pieces of evidence that Mr. Rittenhouse raised his gun. But the defense is seizing on them, and they inaccurately said that it took him 20 hours of work to do. He worked on that drone video for 20 hours. He made us multiple uh, shorter videos of it. These images were the last part of that work. And that image does show Mr. Rittenhouse holding a gun. It is blurry, does it show every detail? No. But we thought it important that there at least be some still shot besides these videos. The second one I showed, again, is very blurry, but it's of the shooting. And you see Mr. Rittenhouse blurry, you see the puff of smoke, and you see Mr. Rosenbaum blurry, still very much upright. And that is why those pictures are given. It was the tail end of all the work that Mr. Armstrong did on this video. The defense seems very scared of these, of these pictures because it helps to prove their client lied on the stand, and it shows that he provoked the attack. <coughs> now I would like to show you, I believe this is the full drone video, Exhibit 73. So in this one, it is difficult to see the raising of the gun because it's the full video. Uh, I would encourage you, if you find it necessary, to take a closer look at the bigger TV. Please stop it. Now, if you see in this video, Mr. Richards wants to make it seem like the only recourse the defendant has in retreating is walking into this, mo this mob of people who are breaking cars. But look at all that open space that he has. At this moment, he could have turned around and ran in that space and gone right back of Sheridan, and everyone would be alive and everyone would be fine. Instead, he decides to start slowing down and run into these cars in which he is supposedly trapped, which would be like being trapped in a Target parking lot. As you see, as we keep playing it, he goes around them no problem, and he goes right into this totally clear space that was available to him the whole time. He did not exhaust his duty to retreat. He did not exhaust all of his options. Now, I'm gonna to go to the video, I'm gonna point something out. Mr. Binger is gonna play it again and I'll show you. Uh, this is in relation to, Mr. Richards indicated that no one that uh, attacked, or that went after Mr. Rittenhouse in the second incident observed the shooting. That is not true. Uh, this video shows the person that is referred to as jump kick man leaving the scene. And we have another view as well from another video, but I'll point that out. Out of the way. This is. Jump kick man is right here. He sees it. He's standing there the whole time. And he 
comes and he helps push the man in the wheelchair out of the seat. So he absolutely was there. He did see what happened. What's next? This is Exhibit 10. This is the Ford Fisher video. Uh, if you look after the shooting, it shows this individual pushing the wheelchair away from Car Source 3. There he is across the street, pushing the man in the wheelchair away out of the scene. you've seen before it does look better on the uh, large television uh, but this is where he comes into the screen uh, this is one of the videos that mr. Armstrong cropped for us in his 20 hours of work uh, this is slowed down down by 50% and it zooms in as good as good as possible given the limitations of the video uh, I'll point it out up here but I said it is better seen on the large TV <coughs> there he is pointing the gun he's not close enough to the car to have that good factor Puts on the fire extinguisher, he freezes up. Uh, it is. Now the, do the next student in. Oh, we got it. Again, that really wasn't an issue at trial until the defendant lied about it. Now exhibit 84, this is a, another video that Mr. Armstrong did in his 20 hours of work. And this shows the part of the chase. That's where you see him point. Mr. Uh, Rosenbaum <coughs> does his jump. <coughs> see the defendant slowing down, seemingly preparing to shoot. And look where that first shot is. Go back one more play one more time. This is the zoomed in image that will eventually was shown. Look how far he's not reaching. He's being shot in the hip and falling. And he goes immediately to the ground and the defendant sees fit to keep shooting at him although he poses absolutely no threat. Again, four feet from the barrel of the gun, not from Mr. Rittenhouse himself. Here is another video Mr. Armstrong made in his 20 hours of work. I believe he made six of them all told. They're all in evidence. Here's a close-up of the final shooting. The puff of smoke is already out. He's already upright. He crumples immediately to the ground, but the defendant keeps shooting him. So did Mr. Rosenbaum turn and get shot in the back that way? No, he was even less of a threat. He was falling face first on the ground with his hips shattered. So yes, he was shot in the back, and he was killed by a shot in the back, and it was the third or fourth shot.
Merck, um, Attorney Richards indicated that Nick Smith called the defendant. Nick Smith did not testify to that. He was never asked. We don't know who or what, who called the defendant to go to that scene. And despite the fact that there's this madman out there who's such a threat and is going to kill the defendant, he just saunters down there all by himself. No problem. He's not scared. This threat, if it even existed, was not taken seriously. He's a babbling idiot, as Mr. Lukowski said. Mr. Rittenhouse testified he didn't hear the, the, anything before he shot. He didn't hear this fuck you. He didn't factor in the gunshot. There is no evidence that Mr. Huber did anything untowards that evening. Uh, they talked about pushing a dumpster, picking up pepper balls. That was not evidence that was ever submitted in this trial. And I don't know where it comes from. No evidence that he told Gage Grosskreutz I had to shoot in self-defense. And Attorney Richards talks about how, well, Mr. Detective Howard testified in a certain way and how he didn't talk about the drone footage or anything. He knows we got the drone footage, surprisingly, after Detective Howard testified. Guns do not have handed. There's not a left-handed or right-handed gun. So, yes, the demonstration that Mr. Binger did is how it happened. The defendant was facing that way. He picked it up, and the videos show it. Detective Antaramian reviewed it and saw it and, show, and testified to it, and it wasn't an issue until the defendant lied. Videos don't lie, but we know Kyle Rittenhouse does. He lied all that night. A lot has been made about how Gage Grosskreutz had an attorney. How hypocritical from a lawyer to hear someone criticize someone else hiring counsel. Mr. Rittenhouse isn't here alone. He has lawyers. And I apologize that the district attorney's office followed our interpretation of Marcy's Law, which is a fairly recent, especially at that time, constitutional amendment. Gage Grosskreutz is not on trial. He followed the advice of counsel not to turn over his phone. Just as anyone who hires counsel can do, they can follow the advice of their counsel. We got his old video from that night. The defense has seen it. We have it. What else do we need? Text messages from three weeks before? They just want to try to dig up dirt because they think it's there because the defense wants you to believe that these people got what was coming to them that they were bad people doing bad things, and we should be proud and boastful of Mr. Rittenhouse for killing them. Gage Grosskreutz testified what he heard, that he heard I didn't shoot anyone, and Gage Grosskreutz acted on that. He then followed, it went, he left Mr. Rittenhouse thinking that he was not involved in the shooting, and started going to the shooting of Mr. Rosenbaum, before being told by others that saw it that he was the shooter and then he returned. So Gage Grosskreutz relied on this statement of Mr. Rittenhouse. We're talking, let's talk about a rush to judgment. Mr. Rittenhouse turned himself in. Are you supposed to be days, weeks, months to charge murderers who we know murdered people? It's a red herring, as Mr. Binger said. It's throwing up red herrings, false hypocritical arguments, and attacks on those that Mr. Rittenhouse killed to try and distract you from the fact that he was not in imminent fear of death or gate bodily harm, and he was not privileged to act how he did. We heard from Ms. Carrie Ann Swart. Now that Nathan De Bruin talked about jail, now we can try to smear Mr. Rosenbaum more, although there really is no dispute, or was no dispute, that he came from a hospital. He's carrying a hospital bag. 
Ms. Swart testified that she talked to the hospital about how he would be released, that he went to this hospital. She knew he was coming home from the hospital. She knew it was in the bag, and he showed that picture of it backlit against the fire, trying to make it seem sinister. She talked about how there were medical papers in there, and we did that image again, Mr. Armstrong did this image for us, where you can get a little peek in the bag, and I would argue you can see medical papers. Though that big image, that big image they see, looks like rolled up medical records that you get when you're discharged from a hospital. And Ms. Swart testified that he was given medications that day. Perhaps they didn't work, perhaps there was a bad reaction, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. But he was given them that day. He could not get the ones for future days uh, because things were closed. Uh, Balch did not testify that he thought there was anything sinister in the bag. Um, he made, he said he said something in, inaccurate at the time, but he said that he saw shampoo bottles and a water bottle. Mr. De Bruin. He did take some nice photographs, and he clearly wanted the world to know that he took some nice photographs. He's really more relevant to Mr. Zeminski, and he apparently, this is the photo of the bag, you can examine that further. Mr. De Bruin must have some problem with police and DA's offices. He goes to the detectives, he doesn't give a full story. He says, he testified to this, this is not me saying anything, he forgot things because he was so nervous because the, the door to the police station still had an unrepaired window. That caused him such nervousness that he could not give a full statement. He meets with us in a very polite, short meeting. He has very little relevance to this case that we knew about. And yes, we showed him some videos. Is this Josh Zeminski? Oh no, it's not. Okay, would you see him in these other pictures? Yes. You don't know it's Josh Zeminski? Okay. Somehow that's us getting him to change his statement. Did you say that? What's that? Did you say? We show him pictures, videos, say, is that Josh Zeminski? I don't know. We show him other pictures. Do you recognize that as the same person? Yes. That's not getting him to change his statement. We had him read a statement. Do you have anything to add to it? No. The next day, he goes over to Mr. Richards' office. All of a sudden, he knows all this extra information that wasn't in his statement. Oh, but he was so nervous meeting with us because we showed him a video or photograph that he took of Joshua Zeminski. And then what does he do? He goes and hires a lawyer very closely connected with a gossip blogger who attacks my office on a regular basis and who is very pro Rittenhouse. Another just funny coincidence in this case, just like how Mr. Hernandez, who doesn't live in this state, could hire any of the thousands of attorneys in Wisconsin or tens of thousands of attorneys in the state, but no, he hires an attorney who Kyle Rittenhouse's defense team has already paid money to that firm. What a coincidence. So Mr. De Bruin doesn't tell us any information, then tries to attack us, and then gives, tells the defense a lot more information. Mr. Rittenhouse denied pointing a gun at the yellow pants man, said he was being sarcastic. Well, Mr. Richards basically just admitted he did point the gun. So which is it? We know that Mr. Rittenhouse was going around that night trying to be a paramedic, a policeman, and a fireman without receiving any real training in any of them. Tough job to do all three at once. And he went around with his gun trying to scare people, to intimidate them, to not do minor property damage. He's a chaos tourist. He was there to see what was going on act important, be a big deal. And then the moment a little bit of that chaos comes, chaos comes back at him, he cowardly shoots a man instead of fighting back. You put yourself in this situation, you know it's gonna be out of hand, it gets a little out of hand, someone is chasing me, and you have to shoot him. 
that is not privileged. That is not reasonable. And that is not what any reasonable person in the defendant's shoes would have done. We keep hearing about this rock in this hand. There's no evidence of there being a rock in that hand. Now, there's talk about how the defendant maybe have re-racked his gun. We don't see that in the video. We don't know what he did. But we do know that as Gage Grosskreutz is sitting there with his hands up, the defendant turns over his gun and is looking at it and is doing something with it. Fully reason, the defendant admitted to this, that he looked at the gun. Fully reasonable that Mr. Grosskreutz could have assumed that he was re-racking and preparing to fire. And it does not mean that a unspent shell casing has to be on the ground. Officer Bray testified that she shot AR-15s. She knows AR-15s. There's an uns if, if it jams and there's an unspelled shell casing, the re-racking will take out the unspent shell casing. It does not have to be a live round. I don't know what he was doing with his gun, but it's certainly reasonable for Mr. Grosskreutz to interpret it that way. And then what does he do? He doesn't step back and take a firing position and shoot. He didn't shoot him five to six seconds earlier when, he was, when Mr. Rittenhouse was being an active shooter after having killed his second person and shot at his third. He would have, any, he would have every right to have, uh, to have stopped Mr. Rittenhouse's activities at that point. But he didn't. He came up closer. He surrendered and he said, or, you know, he believed his surrender was not being accepted. Who shoots someone like this? Is he trying to shoot his own hand off? He never does anything about an actual position to shoot that gun. And as Mr. Richards admitted in his closing, when it's pointed at his head, his, his arm is already blown off. We're supposed to be so scared of Mr. Grosskreutz with his Glock when the defendant is holding a loaded AR-15. Then there's this preposterous argument that, oh, Kelly Zeminski is holding a flashlight. It must be to bash heads. Certainly no one carries flashlights at night to walk home in the dark or walk to your car in the dark. I take one, I take my dog for a walk. I'm looking to bash in heads. No. We hear about how, oh, this vicious kick that, if you watch it live, did not seem to make much contact, spun him 180 degrees. That is Kyle tracking him with the gun and shooting at him. He's moving as he's moving. That is not the force of the kick. And the video makes that clear. But again, we're grasping at straws and we're throwing out red herrings. <coughs> and now, a skateboard is a deadly weapon. Someone should tell all the parents and grandparents and Santa Claus giving skateboards this Christmas about how they're giving their children a deadly weapon. I guess they should get him an AR-15 instead. It's just preposterous. And yes, Mr. Huber was acting heroic in holding down that, and taking that skateboard and trying to hold him down and trying to take that gun. And what happened? The gun stayed attached to Mr. Rittenhouse. Because when the defense concocted this, they were trying to take my gun story, they left out that it is literally strapped to him. He shot an unarmed man four times because he was so scared that Mr. Rosenbaum was going to take the gun away from him when it was attached to him. It's an absolute red herring. It is an absolute ridiculous argument. Imminent threat. Not, oh, in five minutes after we, we get beat up, then I might be in threat. Imminent threat. You've heard all the videos. I'm not going to go into it any more great length. But when you listen to the crowd as Mr. Rittenhouse is running, they start running. They start yelling after he's running when they're screaming, get him. Also, as people are approaching him at the end, they're asking, why did you shoot him? Why did you shoot him? These are people that were provoked because they witnessed 
an attack or heard shots or heard he was attacking and they took action. As Mr. Binger said, I probably wouldn't do it either. But that they did it is brave and they did not deserve to be killed. Kyle Rittenhouse has a strong ties to Kenosha, but he needs Google Maps to find a business he says he's driven by every day. He supposedly knows Kenosha so well and is such a uh, familiar with Kenosha that he doesn't realize you can walk one block either way to get back to the car source. He didn't want to go back to the car source. He wanted to go see what was going on. He wanted to stay in the action. He wanted to continue to do things that would make him feel big and make him feel important. These minor injuries we've heard the defendant have, again, Mr. Richards misstated the standard. It is not could have caused great bodily harm or death. It is not likely to have caused great bodily harm or death. It is imminent threat of death or great bodily harm. Where is that when you get a couple scrapes? Everybody takes a beating sometimes, right? Sometimes you get in a, a scuffle and maybe you do get hurt a little bit. That doesn't mean you get to start plugging people with your full metal jacket AR-15 rounds and no bullets are not bullets. And we heard testimony about that. Mr. Richards mentioned this in opening, but apparently he's noticed that the evidence doesn't bear it out. He talks about this how Mr. Rosenbaum put this shirt over his head to hide his identity because he's going to go ambush Kyle Rittenhouse. Well, then obviously he watched the videos. He's had that shirt on his head for some time. Whether it's COVID, this is all pre-vaccine as we know. Whether it's tear gas, whether it's fire, whatever it is, he's using to protect his face, not as some evil plan to get Kyle Rittenhouse. They're setting this fire and they begin walking down Sheridan. There's no evidence that they knew he was coming. There's no evidence that they had any plan to get him. I would submit to you that the Zeminskis and Mr. Rosenbaum were doing what they were doing all night. They were going to go bash that Duramax or start or stoke a fire. Kyle sees this and then he runs onto the scene. That's clear in the FBI video. He runs onto the scene. He puts down the fire extinguisher. He raises up his gun. Mr. Rosenbaum yells, gun, gun, gun. Why else would he yell that? It's very possible that while he was yelling, friendly, 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 he's doing so while holding a loaded AR-15 at the Zeminskis. Mr. Rosenbaum was going to chase him out of there to end the danger. And Mr. Richards boasts, that, you know, something along the lines, you won't do shit, motherfucker. Well, Mr. Rosenbaum was wrong. Oh, that's, that, that's an attaboy right there. Way to kill someone unarmed because you won't engage them. He raises the gun. He provokes the attack. He has to retreat. He has to exhaust all remedies before he can use before he regains the right to even use self-defense, not even to use deadly force. That's a whole other separate question. He does regain the use of right self-defense if he exhausts all options. He does not. He could have ran a different way. He could have fought. He had all sorts of different ways to exhaust his options. He did not do it. As I said in the beginning of my closing, I don't think you even need provocation. An unarmed man chasing you and you shoot him four times as he's falling, kill, and you kill him as he's falling in front of you, because you don't want to physically defend yourself, that's first degree reckless homicide right there. And Mr. Richards kind of plays games with the name reckless. Reckless means not intentional in this circumstance. And you can read the jury instructions, you can come to your own conclusions. And fire an AR-15 in any circumstance like this shows utter disregard for human life. There's no other explanation for it. If you're shooting an AR-15 at close range of people, you have no disregard for human life. That's not really in any dispute. 
I want to leave you with this. The meaning of reasonable doubt. I'm going to read portions of this instruction. Obviously, you'll have the whole instruction. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation. That's what the defense is asking you to do, to guess what Mr. Rosenbaum is doing, to speculate what Mr. Rosenbaum is doing, to speculate and guess what Mr. Huber and this unidentified man were doing. We don't know because he killed two of them. All we can look at is the evidence and see him standing pretty much straight up or exactly straight up when he was shot in the hip and immobilized. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. The defense's whole case has been trying to stoke sympathy for Mr. Rittenhouse and showing how everyone else was just a terrible person. Every life counts. Every life matters. If people did bad things that night, they could have been prosecuted. It's not up for Mr. Rittenhouse to be the judge, the jury, and eventually the executioner. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. There's a lot going on in this case. We all know that. We all knew that from the day we walked in on November 1st. But this verdict should be about what the facts are and what Mr. Rittenhouse did. That's what the 12 of you who go to deliberate will go and decide. You are the fact finders. You decide what is beyond a reasonable doubt. You decide what he is guilty or not guilty of from this menu of options that you now have. An imminent threat. The only imminent threat that night was Mr. Rittenhouse. He was not acting in legal, justified self-defense. He's guilty. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Krause. Members of the jury, the time has now come when the great burden of reach, reaching a just, fair, and conscientious decision in this case will be placed wholly with you jurors, selected for this most important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, passion, prejudice, or political beliefs. You will disregard any impression which you may have regarding what you believe to be my opinions on the guilt or innocence of the defendant. You will disregard the claims or opinions of any other person or news media or social networking site. You will pay no heed to the opinions of anyone even the President of the United States or the President before him. The founders of our country gave you and you alone the power and the duty to decide this case based solely on the evidence presented in this court. You will fearlessly keep faith with those who have entrusted to you the fair rendition of justice and the protection of our freedom. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind, and as upright citizens, to return just and true verdicts. You will decide only whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offenses which are charged. Any consequences of your verdict are matters for me alone to decide, and must not affect your deliberations. It will be for you to determine whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty as to each of the offenses charged or submitted. You must make a finding as to each count of the information. Each count charges a separate crime, and you must consider each one separately. Your verdict for the crime charged in one count must not affect your verdict on any other. This is a criminal and not a civil case, and therefore, before you can reach a verdict which may lawfully be received, it must be reached unanimously. In a criminal case, all 12 jurors must agree in order to arrive at a verdict. When you retire to the jury room, select one of your members to preside over your deliberations. That presiding juror's vote is not entitled to any greater weight than that of any other juror. 
I am. Uh, we're going to stop at this point, and uh, I'm going to ask that you return tomorrow. I'm going to let you let you take a vote. Um, when you want to start tomorrow, uh, you could choose eight. You can choose eight thirty. You can choose nine. Um, how many would be in favor of starting at eight thirty? How many want to start at nine? At uh, I missed eight, didn't I? Um, how many still want to start at eight? How many would like to start at nine? All right, that's the clear consensus. Well, it's not a consensus, but uh, clear plurality, probably majority, I think. And uh, so we'll start at nine tomorrow, as as we have been. Uh, the case is ready for decision by a jury of twelve. We don't have that, uh, and it's so it's just as important as ever. I'd say more so, except that it was always important that you not discuss the case with anyone. Uh, and you won't have to resist that much longer now because you'll be able to decide the case. Um, please don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial or anything to do with the trial. And um, tomorrow morning we'll, we'll assemble, and uh, as I indicated earlier, the tumbler over there will be used. Uh, all of uh, your numbers will be placed in there. And uh, six of the, well, assuming there are still 18 of you, six of them will be drawn out. And um, those persons will be held in reserve and will not join the 12 in deliberation. Um, we're going to retain you here at, in the building, those of you who are, are not uh, selected. Uh, we'll stay here in the building and um, uh, in the event that your services are needed as we continue the case, and um, then uh, the 12 of you who are uh, the jury selected will uh, commence your deliberations at that point. So, again, no talking about the case. Please don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Any questions, anybody? Enjoy the evening. We'll see you tomorrow. For the obviously, you're going to want to be here, and you better be. Uh, Nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I sent them to you uh, electronically. Uh, yeah, about two forty-five, I think. If, if they don't get it, if you didn't get them, I had some trouble with your email yesterday, but I think I got it resolved. I hope I did. If not, let me know. Okay, great.